Today's webcast is all about unveiling new and updated state authorization white papers. Next slide, please. Okay, we'll go ahead to the next slide. Got ahead of myself here. Terrific. If this is your first webinar with us, there's just a few things I want to point out so that you can interact. Only the speakers have audio, so we encourage you to participate by either posting a question in the question box or sending a note in the chat. The webcast is being recorded. We'll make a, the link to the recording and any resources that are shared available to you next week. You can also access today's presentation in the handout pane by clicking on the handout box and downloading the PDF. If you're interested, you can follow the chatter on Twitter by following the hashtag WCETWebcast. Next slide, please. Now I'll go ahead and pass it over to our presenters today. Hi everybody, this is Cheryl Dowd. I'm the director for the State Authorization Network. And today, as you see, we're going to be unveiling several papers. Uh, what we have are a collection of white papers that we've called talking points that have been available uh, with WCET and SAN for um, sometimes as much as two to three years. And what we've decided is that we wanted to look back at these papers and uh, see what revisions and updates that we could provide and see what other topic areas that we wanted to add. And so we have nine papers that we're previewing today to share with you. These are available on the WCET website and as we go through these slides you'll see that there are links to these papers um, that uh, you can find um, on the slides and they are available on WCET's website. Currently, because we are in the process of um, putting these on the website, you will not have the access to a downloadable PDF this week, but by the end of next week I anticipate that each of these web pages will also have a link on the side that has a PDF document that you can download and share um, at your convenience. So I we will look through a variety of these. We'll, as you see here, we'll start with the 10 steps to begin the state authorization process. We will move into a series of papers about professional licensure. Then we have field experience paper and a MOOC paper. And then state the differences between state authorization, SAN, and SARA. And uh, our last presenters will discuss the non-credit paper and a military paper. And after that, we will take questions. And as Megan was saying, we're going to save these questions until the end of the presentations. So if you have a question or if you're having any difficulty, please don't hesitate to put your thoughts in the question box that's in your dashboard. And there's me. I'm Cheryl Dowd. I'm the director for the State Authorization Network, SAN. And we have uh, presenters today. We have six different presenters today. We're, we have Beverly Wade, who's the director of state authorization at University of Pacific. Terry Taylor Strout, who's a senior research analyst for WCET SAN. Cheryl Thompson, CEO of Her Consulting LLC. We have Jenny Parks, who is the regional director for MSARA. Marianne Boki, who's senior associate with NCHEMS. And Jeannie Yoki Fine, who is state regular, regulator services advisor for Cooley LLP. Our first presenters are Beverly Wade. Um, and Terry Taylor Strout. And I'm going to turn it over to them to uh, tell them a little bit about themselves and to share a bit about their paper. Beverly? Hello. Um, as Cheryl said, my name is Beverly Wade. I serve as the Director of State Authorization at the University of the Pacific and I have been in this role for several months now. Prior, I served at um, the University of Arkansas doing state authorization there for about four years. And Terry, could you share a little bit about yourself, please? Sure. sure. I'm Terry Taylor Strout. Um, I've been with WCT as a employee since January, but a, a friend and family member for about 20 years. Um, most notably, I started the University of Colorado's virtual campus 20 years ago this year. 
um, and worked in with the founding team with the Western Governors University. But I'm fairly new to state authorization, so I'm still learning. Great. Well, uh, could we, Beverly, would you mind starting us out with a bit about your paper? Sure. Okay, so the 10 steps is basically an update to a blog post that was written in May 2012 by Sharmila Mann, Russ Poulin, and Marianne Pokey. And during that time, WCET was tasked with providing initial guidance to institutional leaders and staff about how they could start the state authorization process. <clears throat> so this fifth anniversary edition is going to update the basic information about how to get started and adds new information related to the impact of SARA membership on that process. So some of the new information includes segments specific to SARA institutions, such as the importance of conducting an assessment prior to electing to operate under SARA membership status, especially if you're out if you have authorization in SARA membership states, as well as developing a relationship with your portal agent and what document can be used to establish that your institution, your institution will be operating under the SARA membership. Wonderful. Terry, uh, would you like to add anything uh, more in that uh, regarding the document? Sure, just a little bit. Um, my role in this paper was really to read it as a newbie and, you know, say what I know how to start. And I think when I read Beverly's update, the thing that, in, in, you know, was the biggest influence to me was how little changed um, other than the Sarah pieces. But Sharmila and Marianne and Russ did a great job five years ago of kind of laying out a very simple, easy to use, this is how you you know, begin to wrap your arms around this. So uh, that was my biggest impression. It was just that while so many things have changed, you know, how you really get started with this remains the same. And I thought Beverly did a fabulous job of laying out in a way that Sarah and non-Sarah so that somebody who's new to state authorization um, could really use this document very quickly and easily. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for your coordination on this. And uh, as, as you both were indicating, uh, this provides someone who's new to state authorization the ability to dive into the work and understand how to move um, from step to step to help their institution be in compliance. So thank you very much for your work. And we will move on to our next paper. We now have Cheryl Thompson, who's the CEO of Her Consulting, and I'd like Cheryl, if you could please tell us a little bit about yourself before um, diving into your papers, please. Sure, and thank you for this opportunity. Hi, everybody. Um, some of you probably know who I am, but my name is Cheryl Thompson. I currently have a consulting company that uh, is just me at this point, but I work with institutions in state authorization, professional licensure, a little bit on accreditation, um, and also with SARA. Uh, I was on the original drafting team for SARA, and I did the state authorization work at three different institutions prior to going into my own business three years ago. So I thank you again for having me be a part of this uh, webinar today. So the uh, first paper I'll talk about is the one that deals with the intersection of professional licensure and state authorization. Uh, you'll hear me repeat one thing probably more several times uh, during my time here, and that is there really weren't a lot of substantive changes at all. It mostly was just general edits. So um, I did add a reference to um, that the federal regulations there are new ones, and so institutions need to pay attention to that. Um, and also referred institutions that participate in SARA that there are uh, good resources for them in the SARA manual um, that they will want to access and be familiar with. So really there isn't a whole lot of change itself on that, as well as the next paper is on disclosures regarding state authorization and professional licensure. Uh, here, again, it's just general edits and updating. Um, I put some things in the past tense rather than the future because this was originally written in 2015, I think, and some things have changed since then. So um, 
there again aren't a lot of substantive changes. Again, I refer people to the um, very briefly to the federal regulations that have were published in December, and that's about that's about it. I mean, it's worth taking a look at again, but there aren't big uh, changes. Carol also asked me though to write a new a new paper, which I have done. And it's called the newly published federal regulations and professional licensure disclosures. So this is one that you haven't seen yet. Um, what I did here is I went to, I gave a little bit of background on uh, the purpose for this paper and all about consumer protection and different things. And then I first talked about the federal regulations that are currently in place as it pertains to disclosures. But then I went into the new regulations and I had to go into some detail for the paper to make any sense, but I at the same time tried to keep it as concise as possible. So I, I highlighted what the um, public disclosures are re that are in the um, regulations and the required individualized disclosures. Um, and then just reminded the reader that there are state individual state uh, disclosure requirements as well. And this is especially true uh, if you are not a SARA participating institution. Uh, but there also are disclosure requirements from maybe a programmatic accreditor that you, one of your programs may have, or a professional licensing board in your state may require you to publish a certain statement regarding your program. So um, those are things to just be aware of. Um, I also then talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we have with, or I first talked about the distinction between the federal, state, and SARA disclosure requirements, but just also pointed out that the federal regulations, um, unfortunately, are a bit confusing, and we're hoping that they will clarify this before long. And that has to do with the regulations keep referring to where a student resides or their state of residence, and as any of you know who have been in state authorization work very long at all, know that state authorization doesn't pay attention at all to where a student lives. It's where the activity is taking place. So I'm hoping that many of us are hoping that there'll be some clarification coming. There was a window of time where the federal government had the opportunity to uh, roll back the regulations that were published in December of 2016, which by the way, our effective July 1 of 2018, um, but that window of time has passed. Now the federal government has other options uh, at their disposal, but we're in a wait and see period. Because we're in a wait and see period, it's wise for institutions to be looking at these regulations and uh, starting to prepare for them because uh, we don't know when the federal government will make a decision or if they will change their mind about anything and it will take more than a couple months for you probably to get every all your ducks in a row to be in compliance with all those detailed regulations on disclosures. The next paper, the next two papers that I updated was the one on field experiences and MOOCs and again in these two papers it was mostly um, just basic edits that I made, not changing content, and the links were updated and so forth. So um, that's pretty cut and dried on that one. So Cheryl, I think that concludes um, my review unless you have some questions for me. No, I appreciate that very much. Uh, so uh, the, the point in having these updated was for you all to know that uh, someone had given a careful review of the substance that was provided in the papers originally um, to ensure that it is, uh, it is current as well. So Cheryl did a very a great job reviewing and making minor um, revisions as needed, but can you can assure you can be assured that this is up to date information so that you can have that kind of resource available to you. So thank you very much, Cheryl. I appreciate all of the work that you did to go into reviewing your your papers and also making revisions and adding a third to your series in regard to professional licensure. So thanks very much, Cheryl. You're welcome. Thanks. Okay.
Our next presenter is Jenny Parks, and Jenny Parks, as I was saying, is the director for MSARA. That she's a regional director for um, for the MEC uh, institutions that are a part of SARA. And so I'm going to turn it over to Jenny if she could tell us a little bit about yourself, Jenny, and uh, we'll move into your paper. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, this is Jenny. Uh, for those of you who've never met me, I am the regional director for the Midwest um, for the SARA initiative, and I've been at the Compact almost four years now, and it's the main thing I do there, and I continue to find out more and more about state authorization and reciprocity every day that I do it. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not, but there's a lot of it out there to learn. So I'm really very appreciative that um, Cheryl and Russ have um, put together all these papers. So um, thank you, Cheryl, for that slide. As you can see, the paper that I have helped Cheryl actually co-authored this with me, it's a, it's a way to differentiate between state authorization in general and specifically the State Authorization Reciprocity Agreement or what we know as SARA. And I think it will be a nice complement to um, the document that Beverly wrote because we often hear, especially from people who are relatively new to state authorization, that it's not entirely clear what the difference is between those two things. So. Um, I try to spell that out as much as possible in the paper and to make sure that people um, understand. It's not uncommon for us to get someone calling us and saying, hey, um, I just I want to do this experiential learning thing in another state and I, I understand that I can't do it because of Sarah. So then I have to launch into a, a lot of history and a lot of lessons there. So this is a paper that will take you through the differences between state authorization and SARA, the relationship between the two, specifically that SARA is one way of accomplishing state authorization in some states for certain aspects of state authorization. And um, the, the paper also talks a lot about the, the other types of tool tools in the, the uh, state authorization toolbox that you can use. Sarah is kind of like your, your big tool. It's your universal um, monkey wrench type thing. Um, so take a look at it. Um, it should help anyone who is confused about the difference, differences between those things. So thanks. Thank you very much, Jenny. and, and uh, she does a very good job uh, making sure that folks understand um, the differences. I guess because state authorization is part of the name, we hear from people all the time about concern about what is the difference between state authorization, what is SARA, and actually what is SAN because people often confuse SAN and SARA. I just got an email today that did, did that very thing, and so I. I shared with the person the two, uh, the two different groups and um, offered the websites for them to review. Um, but it is confusing, and so we wanted to be able in this paper to make those distinctions and offer people the opportunity to understand that state authorization can be, they can get assistance in their state authorization compliance work by knowing about SARA um, or participating and participating in SAN. And so we'll talk a little bit later in, in this broadcast about some of the activities that will be coming up in SAN, but it, those of you um, that uh, may not be as familiar with SAN, State Authorization Network is an organization that offers support to institutions in doing this type of compliance work. And so um, we have a variety of activities and training opportunities and network opportunities to be able to um, accomplish uh, the compliance work. So Jenny, is there is there anything else you'd like to add? Or do you think you've got it? No, I think that's it. I just, I, I hope people will get a chance to take a look at it and, and understand. The only other piece um, that I do try to spell out in there is how is it different to maintain your um, good standing with Sarah um, as opposed to your good standing in a place where you are authorized not via SARA, because sometimes people don't understand that there is still quite a bit of work, whether it's tracking data or um, professional licensure disclosures, a number of things you still have to do when you work for SARA, it's just that you know specifically what those are because they're the same for every SARA state. That's a very good point, Jenny. Thanks for raising that, is that SARA does assist the institution with, a, with the compliance requirements for a lot of activities, but there are some activities that the institution will still be uh, need to be aware that they have compliance requirements that not may not be available through SARA. 
um, you know, things like a, um, a structure um, or other types of activities that they may see. So thank you very much for raising that, Jenny. Um, You're welcome. And thanks for participating in this, in this uh, project for us. Okay, I'm going to move to our next presenters. Our next presenters are Mary Ann Bogey, Senior Associate for NCHIMS, and uh, I'm not sure if Jeannie was able to get on today because she's, um, she's traveling, uh, but she is the State Regulatory Services Advisor for Cooley LLP and a good friend of SAN. Um, so Mary Ann, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, thank you Cheryl, and good afternoon everyone. Um, I am a senior associate at NCHEMS, but I do a lot of work for other organizations. In fact, back in the day, in 2010, 2011, I helped SHEO create the, the now very popular SHEO surveys that we all use for state authorization. And that was kind of my first foyer into state authorization work. From there, uh, I started working with Russ Poulin up at WCET on the state authorization issues and then what turned into the state authorization network and now work with uh, Cheryl Dowd on similar state authorization issues. And you, you all probably see quite a few emails from me to, um, asking questions because, you know, it just doesn't matter how long you're in this business. You just can't know it all and things change fast. So I really appreciate all of my colleagues out in the virtual world today that are listening that I've called upon in the past and will probably call upon in the future. So that's enough about me. Let's see, we talked about Jeannie Yaki Fine, uh, works at Cooley Law, but prior to that she was a state regulator in Florida. And she and I wrote uh, two papers. Uh, the first was State Authorization and Non-Credit Courses and Programs in 20, I think 2014. Um, and really what we did for this update, if you will, is we kind of looked at what was going on and what has changed, if anything, and we found that, you know, even though a lot hasn't changed for non-credit programs, this is still a really important issue because even though the federal distance education regulation that was issued in December of 2016 does not regulate uh, non-credit courses. It's really important to remember that individual states have regulations that do and will continue to regulate non-credit courses and programs. This is a, a, a really often overlooked area within state authorization. So just some quick highlights of the paper. We talk about MOOCs, which Cheryl Tom Thompson talked about a few minutes ago. Those are the massive open online courses. They typically are free and open to lots and lots of folks at, at a given time. The key takeaway for that in the paper is that the authorization responsibility lies with the individual institution and usually not with the MOOC provider. So again, even when we're talking about MOOCs, which everyone thinks is just kind of a free-for-all, there are cases where you need to be careful about that and think about your authorization status. We also touch on Sarah in this paper. Um, we've added that, that piece to it. So if an institution is participating in the state authorization reciprocity agreement, Sarah, then the for credit and the non-credit activities in Sarah states are covered by the agreement. So that's fantastic news. Um, uh, finally, we, we talk in the paper a little bit about this need to get authorized in, in some states. Sometimes, though, it's not full authorization. They just want to know you're there, or you might have to get an exemption. So it's not always a ton, a ton of work. Uh, many times it's just letting the states know what you're up to. So for updates for this paper, we actually did outline the states that now require um, authorization for non-credit activities. There are seven of them. And there are four states that require an exemption for non-credit activities. So those are all listed in the paper, and if you want, we can talk about which ones those are later if we've got time at the end. The second paper that uh, Jeannie and I did back in 2013, I had to look at my notes there, folks, uh, was state authorization and military students. So the question of whether an institution must be authorized in states does not depend on whether its activities are confined to a military base. That's a common myth. Instead, the analysis will be the same as if enrollment is open to all state residents. It will depend on the activities the institution conducts in the state, just like anything else. So even though that word military is in front of student, it doesn't change a lot. Um, and we talk, we talk about this 
at length actually in this paper to really help folks get their head around that. It'd be like saying adult students. That doesn't change what you have to do for the law. Um, so highlights of this paper is that most states do not differentiate between military and non-military students, just as I was saying. Uh, another highlight of the paper is we talk a little bit about the importance of tracking students, but particularly your military students, because they tend to move around a lot. Um, and finally, we talk a little bit about the Department of Defense and the TA funding. So if you have signed an MOU with the Department of Defense to get that TA funding in 2014 or later, then they expect you to be in compliance with all state laws, including state authorization. And in fact, they will be checking that. So that's something to think about. Uh, updates. So currently, 16 states expressly exempt institutions operating exclusively on military bases. So again, it's only 16 states that do that. We talk a little bit about a federal enclave. Um, this, is, this has been a tricky piece, I have to tell folks, and we talk about this in the paper for about a paragraph or so and try, try to explain it to the best of our ability. So basically, most federal property, including military bases, are wholly subject to state law. Only federal enclaves can be partially exempt. And, and people have mistaken this idea that a federal enclave includes all military bases. And that is simply not the case. In fact, it's less than 3% of all of the bases fall into that category. Uh, and it's also very difficult to find that out if it actually falls in that category or not. It's not, it's not as dry as you might think. Um, additionally, we've got some state-by-state -state information uh, in this military paper. So we, we've tried to kind of collect some information across the country and say uh, a little bit about what you might need to do if you're in Alabama or Delaware or California. Uh, and we outline it all for you in that paper. So I think those are my, my quick synopsis and uh, updates of the two papers that Jeannie and I put together. And we're really excited to share that with everyone. Uh, and with that, I think I will turn it back over to you, Cheryl. Thank you very much, Marianne. Uh, it was really wonderful to be able to have the opportunity to have these updated. I know they're very important to folks. We get questions about military students all the time, and so I'm really glad that we could provide something that was up to date um, that encompassed all of that because, as Marianne was pointing out, we do see changes. And so there are some states that have changed their regulations uh, since the time that this paper was first written. And uh, we see that in state authorization in general is that we're seeing a number of states, especially since they've become SARA states, making some changes to their state requirements. And so we're trying to keep ahead of that and uh, provide you with the most up-to-date information. Um, th that is the, the last of our papers, and I'd be very happy to uh, take questions from any of our audience members if you'd like to enter them into the chat. And uh, while folks are um, preparing questions for us, um, I'd like to point out that uh, on this slide deck, uh, you'll see that we have all of the contact information for our presenters today. And also you can um, download or upload, whichever it is, uh, the handouts that's in the um, dashboard section that you'll see on this GoToWebinar. Plus, we will be, uh, we've recorded this, and we will be sending the recording to all of you, plus the um, slide deck, uh, for you to be able to review for future, future needs. And so, as you know, I was talking a bit about what the State Authorization Network does. And... Um, and so it does provide uh, research and training and opportunity to collaborate and network with, um, with other members of SAN. And this is where you'll find some more of the information about SAN. It, the first, I'm pointing it right up here, the State Authorization Network pages. And then we have um, focus issue pages um, about state authorization is very general about state authorization. And then the Frontiers blog posts that are edited by Russ Poulin, and they uh, encompass a variety of topics, including state authorization issues. And then I'm going to leave it at this page. These are some of the activities that we have coming up. Um, we have an advanced topics workshop in less than a month, and it sold out quite quickly. 
Um, we have a compliance workshop, which is a back to basics workshop to help people uh, embrace this topic area and uh, move forward at their institutions. I will tell you there are only 10 spots left for this workshop. And so this is going to be held in September. Um, and uh, you can look at the WCET website under SAN events and uh, register for that. And then, of course, the WCET annual meeting. Okay, we're starting to get some questions in here. Um, I, I will open this up for any of our participants, any of our register, uh, excuse me, any of our presenters. Um, this is a very good question. Uh, one of our uh, participants here has asked that, uh, how do you know where an activity is taking place? How would an institution know that? Um, who would like to field that answer? Because that's, that's one that we have a lot of folks that uh, grapple with that question, is how do you know where the activity is taking place? This is Cheryl Thompson. Um, you may not know all the time, but you do need to make an effort to build relationships across the institution um, and almost build a team of people who are aware of state authorizations and the type of activities that trigger the need for authorization. And then um, put in some kind of communication system where they're notifying you if they're going to be doing certain activities in certain states, preferably, of course, in advance and not after the fact. Uh, there's no cut and dried way to do it because a lot of it depends on the institution and its structure and if, how centralized or decentralized it is. But uh, it is something that falls under the responsibility of the person who does the regulatory work. And it's one of the challenges, but also one of the opportunities. And I'd like to add to that. Um, one of the things that I think that is really important, this is Beverly, one of the things that's really important is for us to educate our stakeholders. And so with that, that includes the people that are doing the day-to-day -day work. So while we may be educating the deans what have you, we also need to find who the person is that is doing today, the day-to-day -day work and educate them as well so that they can be your eyes and ears on the ground and that they will then be able to get you that information that you need in the format that you need it in. So that may be using Excel spreadsheets, Word documents, what have you. So the, the question, the follow-up question to that is, um, someone was asking, they're concerned about how, especially in a decentralized type of institution, how would you try to acquire that kind of information? Um, you know, what, what would be your suggestion in terms of perhaps key stakeholders that you may want to reach out to? Uh, this is Beverly again. For me, at both institutions that I've been to, I've talked with the program coordinators. I usually start there and um, dig down if I need to from there. Sometimes with internships, there is a specific person within the programs that that is their responsibility. And so then developing a relationship with that person. So it's not always just a one conversation that you're having. It may be several conversations that you're having so that you can identify the appropriate person or persons to help you to do the work that you're doing. So that's a good point, Beverly. Thank you for making that because uh, we hear this uh, from institutions about how they're very decentralized and, and the situation is this, is that the compliance staff person has to go beyond their office and reach out to these people. So it could be your research, um, your institutional research people, um, making sure that there's something, uh, that they're doing some kind of reporting um, about where activities are taking place, where online courses uh, students are taking online courses. Um, I know that there are conversations that are happening in institutions but, uh, with the registrar so that on a, at least an annual basis, there is some kind of um, direction to learn where students are participating in the activities. They actually ask that uh, when they register each semester. So I know that those kinds of conversations are happening uh, to make sure that that information can be shared about where institutions are participating in activities. Um, this is Cheryl again, and this may sound oversimplified, but another way to at least uh, gain some knowledge with this is to look at your own catalog and the courses. 
and see which programs have like experiential learning. And then reach out, like um, Beverly said, to the coordinators of those programs to get more information. So it's an opportunity for you to educate them, and then they educate you. Uh, but the catalog would be a, not the only place, but a place to get some of that information. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, a, a quick question that I can answer uh, has to do with uh, SHEO updates. Somebody asked if there's a project in place to reach out to the SHEO folks and ask about um, being able to have state regulators update the SHEO web page. And, and I will share with you that um, just recently at the uh, State Regulators Conference, NASAPS, um, there was a very good presentation by, um, by Mary Ann. Uh, Joan Bullion, and um, Marianne, you're going to have to help me with uh, remembering the regulator from Kansas, um, but they presented how to make those changes and the importance of making those changes. So we have reached out to the regulators and asked them um, to make those changes. Marianne, is there anything else you'd like to add about that? Right, thank you. And I, the Kansas uh, regulator was Jackie Johnson. Thank you. So we three did, did do a nice update, I think, on, on where SHEO surveys are. Um, so basically it's automated now. So SHEO has a system in place where it shoots out emails to the regulators, I think twice a year, um, reminding them to do updates. And in my last conversation with the SHEO staff, they realized that they might need to change that and have a more personal touch. Um, you just can't, I guess, wipe away the need for relationships. Um, and we all know that's true in our compliance work. That's what it's all about, building those relationships across campus, building relationships with regulators, with your SARA portal folks, um, and with your, your directors um, at the SARA Regional Compact. I mean, this is what it's all about. And so I think SHEO is now rethinking how they're going to go about trying to get those updates. Because I think what's happening is that the regulators are swamped. They are so busy and, and just don't have time for this. And when they get kind of a oh, you know, a, an email that everyone gets, it's just a uniform sort of thing. It's real easy to put that at the bottom of your to-do list. But when someone reaches out personally from the SHEO office or from the SAN office um, or from WCET, a nice email that reminds folks of how important this is, there's a different, a different sense of urgency, if you will. So I'm hopeful that in the coming months that will, will turn around and by doing so, we'll have more updates in the SHEO surveys because you're absolutely right. They're, they're pretty out of date, and um, it's, just, it's just tough. Thanks, Mary Ann. I appreciate that. And, and we did hear from a number of regulators about how, um, you know, they are trying to work to, uh, to assist to get those in place. And also um, from the standpoint that this is something that, you know, is um, – it's something that is, it shows their uh, state to the rest of the state. So they want to put a good face on that as well. So um, the states are aware of that and they want to help. And for, um, and it was helpful for uh, Jackie and uh, Marianne and Joan to be able to share how to do it because sometimes there's been turnover and they, they weren't always aware of the process. So they did a very, very good job encouraging that. Okay, we have a few other questions. Um, this is a quick one. Uh, somebody asked me where the uh, white papers would be located on the website. Well, they have hyperlinks on here um, that you that we will be sharing, and uh, you will also find it on the state authorization issue page at the bottom of the state authorization issue first page of that. If you scroll down, the talking points are all listed there, and uh, you can click on them directly from there. So there's multiple ways that you can arrive to it. I will be also creating a direct link uh, from the SAN web page as well. So that's a couple of different places that you can reach um, these uh, papers. Um, as, oh, one of our SAN colleagues uh, was very kind of you to also add that uh, another department to reach out at your institution for assistance to determine where your, your students are is to talk to Finan Office of Financial Aid because they are also um, needing to know where the students are. So if you reach out to them, you may be able to um, work together to try to come up with some um, solutions. Um, Jenny, I think this is going to be for you. Um, 
we have a participant here who has asked that they've heard that if your institution is a SARA institution that it covers you in all SARA states. It sounds like that may not be correct. Could you uh, speak to that please? Well, it depends on what you mean by cover. I mean, it, it, being a, a SARA institution allows you to participate in educational activities in other SARA states, um, some educational activities. And it's a nice comprehensive list and it's one that we've put together so that it is rational and it takes care of most of the things that institutions do via distance modalities or, or some other things that would cross state lines. But it doesn't cover literally everything that is conceivable. Um, sometimes, and I actually go through this in a considerable amount of detail in the paper, um, but sometimes the activity in which an institution engages will trigger, will still trigger physical presence in another SARA state. For example, having a branch campus or any type of satellite on the ground instructional facility will trigger physical presence and when that happens actually none of the other state none of the other activities that the institution engages in in that state will fall under SARA they they all fall then under a traditional type of state authorization because it's too difficult for um, the state um, authorizing entities to distinguish between those once there's that on the ground physical presence um, there are also some scenarios that we get quite often from um, institutions where they'll say, well, we want to do this type of a field study or this type of a long trip. And again, we really have to look at those almost case by case and often confer with the um, what we would call the portal agent for the SARA state and say, you know, given what you've experienced of SARA and, and, and the way the laws are in your state, where does this fall? We, we still work on those all the time. And um, so I, I don't know, Cheryl, do you think that's what they're asking is, or what were you thinking was maybe another piece that I needed to address? Well, no, I think that is exactly right. It's to understand, you know, what we presented uh, is that there are activities that perhaps Sarah um, does not provide uh, compliance uh, benefits. And right. so it's determining which activities Sarah provides that in a uniform way across the Sarah states and which activities may not. And so that's a decision right. that someone may need to make. And then, of course, Absolutely. if someone is in a Sarah state and in this and also the Sarah institution, I guess we should be clear on this, too. The Sarah institution, it's a choice of the institution to um, be under the state's um, SARA uh, membership because the right. state becomes a member. You could probably explain that in, in more sure. succinctly than I can, but if you could share that as well. Sure. Well, it is, um, it's voluntary for both states and institutions to join SARA. An institution cannot join until its state joins, but just because its state chooses to join and and goes through the, the steps to become a SARA state, it doesn't mean that the institutions, all institutions in the state will necessarily be SARA states. Some won't be eligible because they're not degree granting or because they might be having some challenges with their finances for a while or some challenges with their accreditation status, what have you. And then there will be institutions who really don't feel like they engage in enough out-of-state activities that they don't think SARA will be of a benefit to them. So, they, so you choose to become a SARA institution and you would um, fill out the SARA application. Again, take a look at the paper. It's, I've, I've walked you through that process. And then once you're in SARA, you get an idea of the, the activities in which you can engage and how to remain compliant. And I do try to give some ideas about the times when you can be pretty confident that what you're doing is falling under um, the umbrella of SARA and when you really need to start thinking about, well, maybe not. And then, and then beginning to reach out and talk to people and figure out if, um, if you need to take some additional steps. Um, for example, with professional licensure, SARA does not cover professional licensure types of authorization or clearances at all. So um, that is definitely an, an activity that would take you into another, could take you into another state as an institution, but um, SARA doesn't provide any benefit there. Thank you very much, Jenny, for making that clear. Um, You're welcome. We uh, can take more questions if you'd like, um, or if you'd like some clarification of the questions that have been, um, have already been uh, addressed. 
Well, uh, I'm not seeing any other questions, but please know that we are always open to uh, receiving your questions individually. Feel free to email us. Um, our email addresses are available on the slides, which will be sent out and are available to, um, to download from the uh, dashboard right here. And uh, so at this point, I'd like to turn it back over to Megan, please, to close us out. Great. Thank you so much, Cheryl, and thank you to all of our wonderful presenters and everybody doing work on state authorization to help better inform our community. Do stay tuned to WCET. We have plenty of activities coming up, including our annual meeting this fall, where there will be several SAN-related activities and Sarah sessions. Next slide, please. Again, the webcast was recorded and we'll make all of the links to the pages, the PDF, and a link to the recording available to you. Next slide, please. And a tremendous thank you to our supporting members and our WCET sponsors that help underwrite and support our programming. Colorado State University, Cooley LLP, Lone Star College System, Michigan State University, University of Missouri, Mizzou Online, University of North Texas, and the next slide shows our sponsors. So again, thank you for all of the wonderful questions, your engagement, and to our presenters today. And thank you, Megan, for um, helping us through today. And uh, I also want to thank my presenters um, once again. And uh, by all means, please make sure that you um, reach out to us if you have any questions or any follow-up. Um, after the webinar. So thanks for being with us today and uh, you can look forward to more activities through SAN and um, you can check the WCET website under SAN events for our future events. Have a good day everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.